This is the College of Knowledge. Simbarashe Muriro. Simbarashe is the founder and managing director of Oxygen Africa. He is a member of the Global Future Council on Entrepreneurship for the 2018 to 2019 period as awarded by the World Economic Forum. I'm an entrepreneur, fisherman first, entrepreneur second. And basically I think this, the topic of my, the subject of my topic today is the last stand, the journey of a startup and entrepreneurship in Zimbabwe. So where exactly does my story start? It's early 2015, we're developing a five megawatt project on the 43 kilometer peg Harare Mtare Road. Um, the panels have come in, we've got our licensing, but the project failed very badly, right? We had challenges with our partners, and in that process, I pretty much lost everything. So all my savings from my, my, my employment, the investment we had put in overnight, it was gone. Um, it's 12 midnight, I'm standing on a railway track, um, Again, same highway because I, I live in Marondera, a couple of kilometers before you hit Peter House, and I'm thinking, look, I'd like to take my own life. I've got nothing else to live for. I meet an old guy who talks me out of it and convinces me that, look, it's really not worth it. You know, there's, there's a lot more to life than just taking it, you're young. I go back home and there's an old MOU that we signed with Old Mutual that basically allowed us to do solar on all their rooftops. And with that, I said, look, this is my last stand. If I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out on my own terms. And I'm going to try again, and I'm going to pitch this particular project to, to, to Old Mutual. I still remember that morning from Marundira, Kombi was about $2. And then from 4th Street to Emerald Hill is 50 cents, and that's all I had in my pocket. Um, unfortunately, that morning, the prices of the Kombis went up. It was $2.50. But I didn't worry about it too much because I had a friend called Takuzgua who worked at the Mikos Hotel. So the plan was go to see Takuzgua, get the balance of the money, and go make your pitch. Takuzgua was not at the office. So I then had to walk from Mikos Hotel to Emerald Hill Old Mutual Headquarters and said, look, this is a $5 million project and I can actually do it. And that's when the real fun starts. You know, I mean, big companies, a nightmare of corporate governance. Several months later, they said, okay, we can change the commercial terms. Here's our letter of, 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 of interest. Now go raise the money. My friend Lionel bought me a plane ticket and gave me a hard train card and I had 50 rands. So the plan was get to South Africa, make your pitch to APSA, and make sure you get on the plane to get back because you have nowhere to stay and, you know, all hell break loose. We made our pitch to APSA. And the funny thing about it is that the first thing they told us was that the project is too small. So you can't really ask for five million, you have to ask for a minimum of 20. Now because we had spoken to several potential financiers, FMO, Norfund, KFW, Barclays, APSA, they said, look, the best way to do is to create a project that is actually worth 20 million, because that's pretty much what we get out of bed for. So armed with a, with a letter of interest from all these financiers, I made my way back. And also what then happened is it's funny because till today the company profile that we have was designed by APSA South Africa. So they did everything for me, the company profile, how the project should be structured, what exactly we needed. So I made my way back to Old Mitchell and said, look guys, we can do 20 megawatts, here's the potential funding, can we go for it? Now, as an entrepreneur in Zimbabwe, the journey is long. So this took a further eight months. And remember, I've lost everything in my previous business. So I've slept on my friend's couch for, a, for God knows I can't remember. Uh, Brendan Malik Brown gave me an office for one and a half years. And in one and a half years, I never got a phone bill, an internet bill. I just said, do what you need to do for as long as you need to do it. That's your desk, work from there. During that time, I've suffered from depression, addiction to painkillers came back because my migraines came back and till today I suffer from insomnia. But then at the certain moment in time you ask yourself, what exactly are you fighting for? You look for a greater purpose to why you're doing your business. And crazy things happen. We applied for a grant from the Africa Development Bank for $600,000 and they had to do their due diligence. And part of the due diligence is the first people they have to speak to is Zesa. Because our business model, we pretty much take away business from Zesa, right? 
So they insisted, Zesa, before we talk to anybody else, we have to talk to Zesa. I made a call to engineer Kupelang Dube, who was visibly agitated because it was such short notice, and he said, come now. We make our way to Zesa, we walk in, my heart's in my stomach, I do not know what's going to happen because everything rides on me getting this particular grant because I can't afford the development costs. The meeting was about 30, 40 minutes. I only spoke for about five. Then AFDB and Zesa had the exchange all throughout. And Zesa inadvertently or purposefully did the pitch for us to the extent that the grant was doubled. So it went from 600,000 to 1.2 million. After that, we had another problem. Because we're a startup, managing a grant is a nightmare. The reporting, the, the, the paperwork. So usually they don't like to give it to startups. So we looked, we looked to everybody, KPMGs, Deloitte's, um, BDOs. So all of them have experiences dealing with multinationals, but not donor funding. You won't believe who wrote the letter to AFDB and said, give them the money, we'll help them manage it. It was ZETDC, even though I'm their competitor. So what, did they, so what does that then tell you? You're not crazy, right? What you're doing has a higher purpose. So we then said, look, as a company, what exactly do we do? So we look to have a competitive advantage in social economic problems. So we don't see ourselves as making profit from electricity. What is our purpose? Our purpose is we provide SMEs with clean, accessible energy. We remove the investment risk for large companies. The RBZ said they spend $16 million a year on electricity imports. At 20 megawatts, you save the country 4.5 million. And then you think to yourself, one day you want to wake up and your child says, this is my dad's business, right? It started 100 years ago. But with all the climate change and everything that's going on, is your company going to be there? Or is not even your company, is the earth going to be there in 100 years time? So we hinged our company on sustainable development goals. So we're talking energy, clean energy access, climate action, responsible consumption, these are pretty much our hallmarks and sustainable cities, right? And then we then think to yourselves to say, um, if you as an entrepreneur, if previous generations made a sinful amount of money poisoning our earth, you know, as the youth of tomorrow, there's absolutely nothing wrong with making a sinful amount of money trying to fix it. I think it's only fair, all right? So we then also decided to ourselves that Zimbabwe is a very challenging environment. Now, considering how far I've come and what I've been through, I can't turn back. So you then put yourself in a mindset that whenever opportunities or things go terribly wrong, instead of looking at the negative aspects of it, you always look at the positives. So everyone always says Zimbabwe's got a lot of red tape. Things take a long time, bureaucracy, it's hard to start a business. The way we look at it is, if an investor wants to come to invest with me, he has to be willing to go through that hell with me, and he has to be willing to respect the bureaucratic processes of the country, and if he's in it for the long term, he's not gonna shy away. So I use red tape as a stress test. And the only company that survived is Soventix and Jabel. Jabel believed in us so much they gave us $15 million in construction finance to say, okay, fine, guys are scared that does solar work. We will risk $15 million in this pariah state because we believe in it. OPEC, the American government, were discussing a local currency guarantee. So yes, they bond notes, fine. But go, go borrow as many bond notes as you can. We will give you a US dollar backed guarantee, All right? So I think to myself, from where I started off, standing on a railway track, to where I've now come, right, there's always a higher purpose, right? You've got to believe in the environment that you're operating. You've got to believe in the sort of impact that you're going to make, as you rightfully said, and what sort of legacy are you going to leave for yourself and for the people that look at my logo, whether or not I win or whether or not I lose, right? So I've crazy things have happened. I've, I've gotten to pitch my, my, my project to the Prime Minister of Rwanda. I've got to pitch my project to Vladimir Putin. I sit on a council at World Economic Forum. I sit on a council at Shared Value Africa Initiative. Why? Because what we believe in in our, in our company is profit with purpose. Yes, we want to make money, but what will we be remembered for? You know, yes, we want to make money, but when people think of you, what is your story? 
Because I'm sure anybody who started their own business, probably even Mr. Guadalupe himself, will tell you that, look, what we go through, you don't want to wish it on anybody. So probably even to the people at Baker Tilly today, you have a situation where someone is going to walk into your office one day, a young entrepreneur, and he's going to have a backpack like I had and no suit. Now, you may look at him and say, but he's a briefcase businessman. From what I've just told you, take a moment to think, probably that briefcase is all he has because he's given up everything he has owned, he's sacrificed everything because he believes in his idea and he believes in his project. And you might not be the CEO of the bank, the CEO of Baker Tilly. You might be an intern, you might be middle management, you might be entry level, it might actually be your very first day, but you could probably hold the keys to whether or not he succeeds or he fails. So in my company, I got lucky. Standard Bank walked with us the entire way. Right? Not as a banker, but as a company that shapes our business, our business model. Right? As he had told you, Zesa helped out. Because we aligned our project to government priorities, they've stepped up and they've helped us out. Not because they've given us any concessions very quickly. I mean, it took us, we got national project status. It took us a year. Right? But what they then realized is, look, at a certain point, this young man believes in his particular project. And by always identifying opportunities, right, where, 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 there is, where there is chaos. So for example, when Bonnos came about, we were dealing with a company backed by Africa Renewable Energy, Africa Renewable Energy Fund. We were basically deciding on whether or not our, our, our contracts will be denominated by UK or South Africa or Zimbabwe. So our lawyers had to look at it one more day and would sign the next day. They walked into the meeting, Herald newspaper, we're introducing bond notes. They walked away. But I then think to myself, in hindsight, if Zimbabwe was so perfect, if everything worked out as it's supposed to work out, as a startup, what chance would I have? So in the midst of all the chaos, because I stuck it out, that's how I managed to start my business. Because if everything was okay, you get the big annals, the big totals, the big global X, they'll come in, put in millions of dollars, and then where would we be? It would be generation of employees, right? So even though the environment is tough, I always believe, the story that I always leave with anybody that asks me what is oxygen, I say, look, stick it out. It's gonna be hard, but it's good. Because as long as you stick, because you don't have to be the best, you just have to survive. That's the most important thing. You just have to survive. And I'm sure probably another person in the room that can tell you a similar story is my colleague, Rudo Boka. So as entrepreneurs, we're not crazy. We share the same backgrounds, we share the same stories. But as a startup working in an environment that is very startup unfriendly, as business leaders in this room, as, as people that hold the keys to certain aspects, if we believe in ourselves, can you not believe in ourselves? As, can you not believe in us as well? Can you not take a risk? Because in the future, I'm your client. I'm the one that's gonna bank with you. I'm the one that's gonna ask for accounting services. But if you don't do this for us, are you gonna be fighting amongst the same companies that have been around for a very long time? So in closing, know your purpose. Stick it out, right? No, no one is gonna believe in you unless they see you believe in yourself first. And as much as things are not well in the country, it's the, only, it's the only home we got. I would never be able to start my business in another country because the laws don't allow, right? But I believe in my country, right? And I believe I'm onto something good. And I'm probably there are thousands of us in the same particular boat. The journey is not hard, but from what I've been through, from the adventures I've seen, places I've traveled, sometimes with nothing in my pocket, it's absolutely been worth it, and I wouldn't trade it for anything else. Thank you very much.